The LG 32GQ850-B is 1440p, 240Hz, can overclock to 260Hz, it's got a nano IPS panel, and it's a massive 32 inches. That's a lot of stuff in one monitor. And the price reflects that. $900, or $800 at the time of filming, which is weird because it just came out. Anyways, is it worth it? Very, if you're into 32 inches. As far as I know, the only other competitor to this at this size is the Samsung Odyssey G7, which is $800. And the difference between these two monitors couldn't be more obvious, at least on the surface. For one, the Samsung has a curved display, whereas the LG is flat. Two, the Samsung has a VA panel, which means that it has higher contrast ratios. However, it doesn't have as good color reproduction. And three, the LG has an extra 20 more refreshes per second, which isn't much, but more FPS is always more better. And even if you can't notice much of a difference, subconsciously, you could have an impact and it could help whether you realize it or not. At least if you're playing esports titles, because ain't no other type of game is gonna be able to take advantage of all of this refresh rate at 1440p. For reference, you could use a GTX 1660 on Valorant and get around 350 to 400 FPS on low settings. For CSGO, Siege, and those other kind of esports titles, you'll want a stronger graphics cards because you're gonna get much lower frames, but it doesn't really take much to push 260 hertz at 1440p. And when you're playing these high FPS games, this monitor feels great because of its stellar input lag of just 6.9 milliseconds at 260 hertz. Nice. That's total system latency, by the way, meaning that it only takes 6.9 milliseconds from when I click my mouse or keyboard to when the action displays on the monitor. Combine that with the fact that it has great response times and you practically have yourself an eSports TV. At 260 hertz, the best overdrive setting is the fast setting, having about three and a half milliseconds of response times, which eliminates any perceived ghosting because it's compliant, all without causing overshoot, which is this blue trail that you want to avoid. This overdrive setting gives a nice blurless image, all with the great persistence of 260 hertz, making esports gaming and motion clarity very clear. By the way, if you don't know what persistence and compliance is, click on the pop-out banner on the top right-hand corner of the screen or click on the link in the video description. Now, I have to give credit where credit is due because LG finally fixed something that I've been complaining about for literally years since I've been reviewing their monitors, and that's their fastest overdrive setting. What LG used to do, as well as pretty much almost every other monitor company, was crank the highest overdrive setting voltage so high that it had no ghosting, but had a metric ass ton of overshoot, making the setting useless and a complete waste. But no more, LG says, because finally the highest overdrive setting is usable. I still don't recommend it over the fast setting though, because even though it has better response times than the fast setting, there is still technically overshoot, even if it's not visible with these 1920 pixel per second images. So if you're trying to get that flick headshot, which usually ranges anywhere from 7,500 to 10,000 PPS, you will have overshoot if you leave it on the faster overdrive setting. Essentially going with the fast setting will give you the same amount of ghosting that the faster setting will give overshoot. So it's best to just stick with the fast setting since visible overshoot is a no-no. The black equalizer is also pretty good. If I had to rate it, I'd say it's about an eight out of 10. It brightens dark areas pretty well, but there are other better options. It also has a color vibrance feature that really cranks the colors to help distinguish enemies if their armor or clothing is similar to their background. This will make it harder for people to hide or blend into their background, making it possible for you to react quicker or even react at all versus just not seeing them. Though this isn't that much of a problem in many new esports titles, since many newer games are very color saturated these days, but the older titles like Siege and CSGO still have a flat color tone to them, so this will really help in those kind of titles. Now, if you're playing a game at lower frame rates, like say anywhere between 100 and 165 FPS, then you'll want to drop the overdrive setting to normal since leaving it at fast will introduce overshoot. And if you're playing something that's very demanding or just poorly optimized and you're playing around 60 FPS, then you'll want to turn the overdrive off, otherwise again, you'll have overshoot. And that's another thing about this monitor. It's not just geared for competitive gaming, it's a do-it-all monitor. So for slower paced games like story games, as well as media consumption, you'll have an experience equally as good as the competitive esports players will, thanks to the massive 32-inch nano IPS panel. 
If you're not already familiar with nano IPS, it's basically IPS, but adds nanoparticles to the backlight, which quote, absorb excess unnecessary light wavelengths, end quote, to increase the color gamut of the display. In layman's terms, nano IPS displays more colors than your standard IPS panel. Colors will look more saturated, but accurately saturated because the display is actually capable of showing more colors while doing so accurately. And it's not like going to your graphics card's control panel and cranking the saturation slider on your typical sRGB display. That would look bad. This will look like those display TVs that you see at Best Buy, which is great because when you're playing games and whatnot, no matter what it is, these colors will blow your mind, especially if you're used to something that's three or more years old or even older, since back then, wide gamut displays were much less common. While we're on the subject, out of the box color accuracy was good, having a delta E of just over five. This means that colors aren't perfect, but unless you're a trained professional whose job is literally working with colors, you'll have no problem with the colors on this thing because they're good. Contrast and grayscale though is a different story. I have no clue what the calibration team at LG was doing, but the default gamma of this thing is way out of whack. Just look at how far off this is. What this is doing is basically making the mid and light grays just way washed out. Just to be clear though, even though it is technically bad, I didn't actually find it being bad. It looks just like any other 27 inch version of this kind of monitor. It also has a noticeable blue tint to it. This is something that's common with LG gaming monitors, but you can easily remedy this by decreasing the blue RGB value a few notches, if you don't like the slight blue tint that is. And that's not all. The out of the box contrast was set a little too high. Swapping between the uncalibrated and calibrated ICC profile shows that it's harder to notice some detail with the uncalibrated profile. It's not really crushing the blacks or clipping anything, but it is noticeably harder to notice those finer details with the uncalibrated default setting when you're swapping between the two profiles just to look for any differences. I think it's fine for out of the box performance, but I still recommend dropping the contrast just a few notches. It won't make the blacks look as black or brights as bright, but I think detail is more important than artificially just adding darker darks. Calibrating the display perfects pretty much every problem this had out of the box, giving it perfect color accuracy, gamma curves, RGB balance, contrast, you name it. This makes it great for any of you colorists who want to game and work at home. Brightness is also impressive, hitting 397 nits, which means you won't have any issues seeing what's on your screen, even when the sun is blaring inside your room. Contrast ratios were disappointing at 849 to one, but this is average for IPS with no special backlight tech, more on that later. So I'm not really too worried about the contrast here. Uniformity is not great, but it is decent. Keep in mind that this is a 32 inch display and the larger the display, the harder it is to usually retain good uniformity. On the left and right edge of the monitor, there is a vignetting effect which has been present with pretty much every other massive monitor I've used. But if you're not used to something this big, just know that your unit might have this as well. Viewing angles are stellar. Being that this is nano IPS, you can expect great viewing angles from literally anywhere. Now, it might sound like I'm being quite a bit critical of this panel's default color performance, but I'm not. So far, everything I'm seeing here is good, apart from the whole gamma situation. Excluding that, I think target buyers will be very happy with the out of the box performance that this monitor offers. All right, let's talk about 32 inches for a minute. When I first started making videos, I absolutely hated any large monitor that wasn't an ultra wide but I think I've gotten over that. As I become older and wiser, I realize that you don't need to have a 24 or 25 inch monitor to perform the best in esports titles. Would a smaller one still be better than this? Yeah, I think so. But with how massive this monitor's legs are, I think that this size of monitor is fine since I have to push it back quite a bit far so it doesn't intrude on my mouse or keyboard space. And since my desk is pretty big, I can push it far enough to the point where I can make it feel like a smaller monitor. And if I wanted to make it feel bigger so games drown out my periphery, I could just buy a monitor arm and pull it closer, making this a truly versatile display. However, I still think a 27 inch model would be better, especially at this resolution. And it doesn't seem like LG has made one or plans on making one. So LG, since you're watching, please make a 27 inch model because that thing would sell like hotcakes. Not everyone likes the size or has even the desk real estate for 32 inches. I mean, come on, this is massive. All right, before I move on to the dislikes, let's talk about some smaller things. 
First is the OSD. It's got a good OSD with a nice design and a good amount of options like your game mode, which are basically your presets for your settings, some game settings, picture settings, and general settings, which has some less notable features. The best way to control all this though is with the on-screen display software, which is LG software to control the OSD. You can easily select your game modes, adjust your settings, and even tie them to whatever software is on the foreground so you don't have to keep fiddling with the nipple. Not that fiddling with nipples is a bad thing. Also, if you buy this, the smart energy saving feature might be set to high by default. If you wanna have max brightness unlocked, turn it off. I was sent the European version of this monitor by accident, I presume, and energy standards are much more strict in the EU than they are here in the US. And this monitor receives an energy efficiency rating of F, which means it's not efficient. And after hearing about how Tech Mama's energy rating is like 50 plus euro cents per kilowatt hour in the Netherlands, I could see why European consumers care so much about power consumption. Here in Northern Virginia, I'm paying 12 cents per kilowatt hour with the national average being about 12.5 cents, which is why you never really hear us American reviewers talk about energy unless it's just really absurd. US energy is cheap. Anyway, back to the monitor. It has 100 by 100 VESA mounting support in case you want to mount this to a monitor arm or stand. It's got tilt, height, and even pivot adjustment, but oddly enough, no swivel. It's got this poor excuse for a wire routing solution. It has decent IO, including two HDMI ports, both of which are the 2.1 spec, a DisplayPort 1.4 port, and a two port USB 3.0 hub. Now, while this monitor is pretty great, there are still a few things I don't like. There isn't much though, because most of this is pretty good. All right, number one is the HDR. It's just straight up trash. I say it all the time and I'll keep saying it until I die. It doesn't matter if your VESA is certified if the experience sucks because the HDR on this does suck. It's got around 16 or 20 zones, but they're all single vertical zones. So you have these nasty lines just going from the bottom to the top of the screen. And this is typical for monitors in this price range. You're not gonna get good HDR and 1440p 240 hertz for $900. That just doesn't exist. You're looking at at least two grand for something like that. So I can forgive this for the bad HDR, but I still don't like that LG and many other companies have bad HDR as a key feature on their website. Issue number two, which might not really be even an issue for you, is that this doesn't have black frame insertion or backlight strobing as many of you know it. Typically this is fine for a monitor that caps at 144 or 165 Hertz, but not at 240 Hertz or higher. I mean, let's be real. The target market for displays with this or higher refresh rates are ultra competitive types, semi-pros and pros. And not having black frame insertion is a downside in my opinion. I know not everyone at the highest skill level cares about it, but it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. That'll probably sway some people away from this to literally any other 1440p 240 hertz monitor, which is pretty much all of the other ones. And I get why they don't include it because black frame insertion on nano IPS looks horrible, but I'm sure they've done something to at least improve on what it used to be a few years ago. And I think it's time LG includes it on their top tier gaming monitors. So in conclusion, the LG 32 GQ850 is a massive everything monitor that does it all great. Great esports performance with super high refresh rates, extremely low input lag, a good black equalizer and color vibrance combo, great casual gaming, story gaming, and media consumption, all because of the 1440p resolution and great colors. The colors out of the box were good, and apart from the whole gamma situation, most of the other smaller inaccuracies can be kind of fixed without a proper calibration. Calibrating it makes it perfect for any colorist that doesn't require a $5,000 plus monitor, and it's got all the features you need like VESA mounting support, good I.O. with both HDMI ports being the 2.1 spec, decent adjustability, and pretty much all the OSD features you need. Not want, just need. But is it better than a Samsung Odyssey G7 32 inch? Well, that really depends on who you are. If you want a wider color gamut, a flat screen and 20 more frames per second, then get the LG. If you want the better contrast ratios, black frame insertion, a curved display, get the Samsung. You can't really go wrong with either, but if I had a pick, I'd go with the LG because number one, it's flat. I don't like 16 by nine curved displays. Number two, it's got a software OSD, which I use all the time. The Samsung doesn't have one at all. Number three, it's got a wider gamut. And number four, 
hey, more refreshes is more refreshes. Can't complain about that. I mean, again, it's a great monitor. It just depends on what you care about more. And for me, the LG just ticks more boxes for what I use a monitor for daily. Thanks for watching. If you guys enjoyed the video, leave a like. If you disliked it or just hate my guts, leave a dislike. Follow me on Twitter and join the community Discord to talk monitors, peripherals, and cats. Have a great day, every day. Peace.